So in this video, I'm going to focus on our loop invariants and why we want to study them and why they are important. I won't go into a lot of details, but uh, the purpose of this video is to just show you how to find loop invariants. So we'll have an introduction, but some examples, and then proofs using loop invariants. Now, bugs matter because if you write bad code, you will have bad outcomes. And the basic thing is that your code has to be correct. And there's no way to check whether your program is correct using just the regular testing. Testing only gives you access to a finite number of samples with you can confirm the output, but it doesn't guarantee that you have no bugs in the code. So the only way to guarantee that is to prove that your code has no bugs using mathematical proof techniques, which is also very difficult. So taking a look at the definition of a loop invariant, the loop invariant is a property that holds true at the beginning and after each iteration of the loop. So some of the objectives of this lecture are things like developing what we call contracts, which contains pre-post pre conditions assertions and loop invariants. Now all these conditions, which are Boolean statements, allow us to establish the correctness of the algorithm that we are looking at. So we can develop then proofs of safety and correctness of the code with these contracts. And eventually develop arguments for termination of the programs, because when you have loops, you have to guarantee that your code will terminate. And then identify the differences between specification and implementation. If you can prove your specification is correct, then if you follow the right implementation methods, you should have a correct program. So some examples of loop invariants, and we will look at the definition of a loop invariant, is that a loop invariant, a Boolean condition that must be true immediately before every evaluation of a loop as well as it's a Boolean condition that's true immediately after the loop terminates. So if you take a look at this code here, see what this code does, we can start with a precondition with this assert that the i is equal to zero and n is greater than or equal to one. So what are some potential loop invariants here? In order to find the loop invariants, you have to know what things actually change within the loop. Because anything that doesn't change within the loop is a loop invariant. But here we know that i changes in the loop and also x changes in the loop. So we can probably find a way to uh, find invariants using i and x. For example, we might be able to show that i less than or equal to n is a loop invariant. We'll leave that discussion for later. So now I'm going to jump into a specific proof of our loop invariants. Now, as we established in the previous example, if you look at this particular piece of code, it's hard to say what this code actually computes. It has three variables, i, j, k, and those i, j, k varies inside. At the end, you return i. So the question is, what is this function g computing? Give an x. So I'm going to start with a, a simple idea here, try to find a proof with loop invariance. So let's suppose that we have this particular example where we have this piece of code that changes inside this loop. Now, in order to find loop invariance, you have to start tracking the values of the things that change. For example, here, the value of AI changes and C changes and I changes. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a table with a, i, a, i, and c. Initially, i is 0. We don't have a value for a, i, or a, 0 yet, but c is equal to 1. But when you go into the loop, with assuming that n is 5, this is going to go into the loop, a, i gets a, i plus c. Assuming that a, i had 0, a, i will become now 1. It will adopt the value of c into a, i. So a, 0 is 1. Now the C changes to 
3. It's going to be C plus 2, and I changes to 1. Then you're returning to the loop. In the next iteration of the loop, what you're going to do is you're going to add the previous value of AI plus 3 to get 4. So that's the new value of AI. So A is a 1 would be 4. And then we in increment, we increment C to 5 and increment I to 2. And then we go back to the loop again. At that point, I is equal to 2. So A sub 2 gets uh, 5 plus 4, which is 9. So A sub 2 gets 9 here. Now you can see how it works. And if you continue to write these values, you will see that it only goes up at, at 4. After this, C will increase to 5, and this will increase to 11. But nothing happens because we are done with the loop. So therefore, at the end of the loop, these are the values of the A sub i. Now we need to think about what could be possibly be the loop invariance. Now one of the very standard loop invariants is i is less than or equal to n, which we can prove. But another relationship that I can see from this table is that the value of c is always 2i plus 1. You can see that clearly from the relationship here. So that's part of your work to find loop invariance. The other thing you might notice from this table is that the value of ai is i plus 1 squared. For example, if i is 1, 1 plus 1 squared would be 4. So a sub 1 would be 4. So let's assume these are the, our predictions that these are the potential loop invariants, and we want to show that these things hold. So how do we do that? So I'm going to start with the idea that we want to show that c equals 2i plus 1 is a loop invariant. You have to show the condition initially. Initially, c is 1 and i is 0, and certainly this relationship holds. Let's suppose that c equals 2i plus 1 at the beginning of the loop. What we need to show as an invariant is that same relationship holds at the end of the loop, although the values of c and i has changed to c prime and i prime. What we mean by c prime is the value of c at the end of the loop, which turns out to be c plus 2. c is the value of c at the beginning of the loop. c prime is the value of c at the end of the loop. Same way, the value of i has changed to i prime. The relationship between i prime and i is i prime is i plus 1. So now if you look at c prime, we know that c prime is c plus 2. That's the relationship. But c from our previous assumption is 2i plus 1. So if you write c equals 2i plus 1 plus 2 actually gives you this one, 2 times i plus 1 plus 1, which gives you 2i prime plus 1. So the whole idea here is that we show that certain, we assume that a certain condition holds at the beginning of the loop, and then we, hold, we show that even when you get to the end of the loop, where both c and i have changed their values to c prime and i prime, the same relationship holds. So that's a proof of loop invariant. The loop termination you can prove by showing that f of i equals i plus 1 because it's, you're always incrementing i is an increasing function. An increasing function should exceed a fixed value n at some point. If you like, you can prove this by contradiction, but it should be trivial enough to just leave it as a simple argument. So let's take another look at a different, different example here. So here's another piece of code where you have a loop, and there are five things that changes inside the loop. And I'm going to list all those five things here, I, C, K, M, and A, I. What I like to do is to find relationships between these things by computing these values for a given n. Let's suppose that we take n to be 4. So initially we start with i equals 0, c equals 0, k equals 1, and m equals 6. All right, after, after one iteration, we, that we set the ai to c. So since i equals 0, AI gets C, uh, C, which is 0. And then the C gets C plus K, so C gets 0 plus 1, which is 1. 
and k gets k plus m, that's 1 plus 6 gets 7, m gets m plus 6, which is 6 plus 6 gets 12, and then the i increments to 1. Next time you go back to the loop, i is equal to 1, a sub i gets c, which is equal to 1. And then we go back to increasing c equals c plus k, which is 1 plus 7 gets 8, then k gets k plus m, which is 7 plus 12 gets 19, m equals m plus 6 get 12 plus 6 equals 18 and then i gets increased to 1 which is 2. All right so you see the idea and then a sub 2 gets assigned to 8. Now if you try to find loop invariance this is really the hardest part for you to do but you look for a relation between for example ai and i. You can see that the ai and i relationship we think is ai equals i cube but just because you prove you see it here it doesn't mean it's a proof so you have to prove that and then we also see a relation between c and i c is equal to i cube and also because inside the loop if you're inside the loop or just outside the loop i should be less than or equal to n and another relationship which is really hard to see is the relationship between k and i so you can, if you compute the value relation between k and i, that's going to be 3i squared plus 3i plus 1 is equal to k. Another simpler relationship that you can see is the between m and i, that m is 6i plus 6. Now, if you think this algorithm is correct, it should be computing the squares, I mean the cubes, of the indices. So a sub 0 gets 0 cube, a sub 1 gets 1 cube, a sub 2 gets 2 cube, a sub 3 gets 3 cube. But let's try to prove one or two of these things next. So I'm going to try to start proving the following. I'm going to start trying to prove uh, the following loop invariant. The first loop invariant I'm trying to prove is m equals 6i plus 1. So let's show that m equals 6i plus, I'm sorry, m equals 6i plus 6 is a loop invariant. Now initially m is 6 and i is, uh, I is 6, i is 0, so that is true. And let's assume that m equals 6 plus i, 6, 6i plus 6. We have to show that at the end of the loop m has changed to m prime and i has changed to i prime, so m prime equals 6i prime plus 6. Now we know the relation between m prime and m, which is m prime is m plus 6. But m by the assumption of the, the loop invariant is 6i plus 6, and then plus 6, and then we factor out that, and then that gives you 6i prime plus 6. In other words, m and i uh, hold that relationship. The next loop invariant I will try to prove is this loop invariant here. Initially, the relationship between k and i holds because i equals 0, k equals 1. And let's assume that it holds at the beginning of the loop, k is 3i squared plus 3i plus 1. So what we need to show is at the end of the loop, we have to show that k prime is 3i prime squared plus 3i prime plus 1. In other words, because we have to show that then k prime is going to be 3i plus 1 squared, 3 times i plus 1 and plus 1. We know that k prime is k plus m. So if I substitute k equals 3i squared plus 3i plus 1, that would be part of this summation here. So let's go back here to see if we can show that. Um, to, to show that, so we can say c prime is equal to c plus k, which is i. This is what we are trying to prove now. So we want to show that c equals i cubed. So initially that's true. Let's assume it's true at the beginning and let's show that when you get to the end of the loop it's also true. C prime equals I prime Q. Now we know by what happens inside the loop C prime means C plus K. But C is I cube with our assumption and the K is here. But we know a relationship between K and I which is so we can replace the K by 3I squared plus 3I plus 1. If you gather all these terms, it gives you i plus 1 cube, which turns out to be i prime cube. So in other words, we proved this is a loop invariant that holds true uh, 
at the beginning at, at the end of the loop. In every iteration, this is true. And therefore, in order to prove this, we had to go through, uh, through two other loop invariants. We had to show this one and this one. So hopefully you will uh, understand this concept and you will see more examples in a lecture.